university leaders, members of our religious communities, staff, faculty, students, alumni, distinguished guests, and friends of Loyola Marymount University, happy Mission Day. <laughs> I'm John Sebastian, Vice President for Mission and Ministry at the University, and it is both my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you here today to the Chapel of the Sacred Heart on this beautiful Friday afternoon for our Mission Day event, which by happy accident also coincides with the 129th anniversary of the death of Father Jean Gaillac, co-founder of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, whom we remember in a special way today. I want to begin by thanking the many people who have made this event possible, including John Flaherty, Jake Blihosh, and the campus ministry team for preparing this beautiful space for us, Kat Brown, Director of Mission and Identity Programs in my office for managing just about every other aspect of this event, Father Mark Reeves and our collaborators in marketing and communications for helping to advertise our program. Ava Cruz Ayedo, my indefatig indefatigable, which is a silly word to put into a script when you have to talk to people, indefatigable <laughs> administrative coordinator in mission and ministry for her logistical wizardry. Uh, Robin Crabtree, Dean of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts for her support in organizing the workshop that will take place this afternoon as part of our program. And our friends, friends in event services and Sodexo for the luncheon which will follow the conclusion of this afternoon's lecture in the sculpture garden outside the chapel to my right. Mission Day is an occasion for celebrating LMU's Catholic identity and the unique blending of the traditions and spiritualities of our three sponsoring religious congregations, the Society of Jesus, the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. On this day, we recall and rededicate ourselves to the three pillars of our university mission, the encouragement of learning, the education of the whole person, and the service of faith and the promotion of justice. And while many of us here know these three elements by heart, I want to encourage you to spend some time this mission day reading the long version of the mission statement, which is conveniently located at mission.lmu.edu. There you will find the encouragement of learning expressed in terms of our, quote, radical commitment to free and honest inquiry, but always with reverence before the mystery of the universe and openness to transcendent reality. At LMU, learning that is either intellectually constrained or that proceeds without wonder is no learning at all. Likewise, the imperative to educate the whole person propels us beyond the kinds of intellectual well-roundedness that any university worthy of the name would claim to promote. Rather, whole person education in the Ignatian tradition aims toward integral human development that marries intellect with affect informing students to be, again, in the words of the long mission statement, thinking, feeling, choosing, evolving selves. Selves whose ultimate orientation is toward the margins, where the need for social transformation is most urgent. And that leads us to the third pillar, the service of faith and the promotion of justice. If the encouragement of learning is the what of our, our mission, and the education of the whole person, the how, then the service of faith and the promotion of justice are the interconnected and inseparable why and where. For it is our faith in God's vision that ennobles us and summons us to be co-creators of a world suffused with love of neighbor. And it is justice that drives us to the margins where we can share our lives with one another in solidarity in order to make that vision a reality. At LMU, we all bear responsibility for promoting this mission, and we all possess unique gifts that can contribute to its enlivening. And since mission belongs to all of us, I was pleased this year to be able to plan Mission Day in conjunction with a year-long initiative called Join the Discourse, led by the Division of Student Affairs and the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts in partnership with other units across campus, including mission and ministry. This project takes its name from the Lions Code, which invites us to join the discourse of the academy with honesty of voice and integrity of scholarship, to embrace diverse perspectives in order to discover what it means to be human, and to shelter and support the intellectual adventures of others. 
Through a campus-wide series of events, we seek this year through this program to provide not only our students, but all members of our LMU community with tools for starting and sustaining inclusive conversations. I am especially grateful to Rich Roshlow, Associate Vice President for Student Life, and Jonathan Rothschild, Associate Dean in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, for the opportunity to connect Mission Day with our efforts to promote inclusive discourse. And it is this commitment to inclusive, constructive, and open discourse that brings us to today's Mission Day speaker. Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio is Professor of Social Ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University. She took up this position this past August after spending 19 years in the Department of Theological Studies at St. Louis University, where she was Professor of Christian Ethics and also held an appointment in Women's and Gender Studies. I am pleased to say that we can also claim her as a lion because she taught here at LMU in the summers during the years between 1996 and 1999. She earned her bachelor's degree in political science from Yale University, a master's from Harvard Divinity School, and the PhD in religion and social ethics from the University of Southern California. She is a highly regarded scholar and public theologian whose research brings the resources and methodologies of social ethics to bear on issues of sex, gender, marriage, and family. Her publications include several books in edited volumes, among them Family Ethics, Practices for Christians from Georgetown University Press 2010, and Reading, Praying, Living, Pope Francis's The Joy of Love from the Liturgical Press 2017. In addition to numerous articles appearing in scholarly journals such as Theological Studies, the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics, and the Journal of Political Theology. She has also written pieces for the popular press, both in print and online, in venues like the National Catholic Reporter, America Magazine, and the Washington Post. She's also provided insightful analysis of the unfolding abuse crisis in the church since the release of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report back in the summer. Dr. Rubio's 2016 book, Hope for Common Ground, Mediating the Personal and the Political in a Divided Church, also from Georgetown University Press, is the inspiration for today's lecture. It is an important, timely, and in many ways prescient book. In it, Dr. Rubio begins from the observation that the divisions that have separated faithful Catholics into seemingly irreconcilable factions along theological and moral lines mirror the ideological rift that has divided society in the United States more generally into red and blue camps. And yet, despite the fog of despair that seems to have settled more or less permanently over our national politics, Dr. Rubio is not without optimism that rays of hope may yet penetrate the darkness, especially for people of faith committed to the common good and to the project of human flourishing. When we began planning Dr. Rubio's visit some months ago, we could never have imagined that when Mission Day arrived, we would be in the midst of the longest shutdown of the federal government in the history of the United States, with no clear end in sight as both Republicans and Democrats, the White House and Congress, dig themselves into ever deeper holes. But neither could we have anticipated uh, that here in Los Angeles, striking teachers facing the challenges of overfilled classrooms and insufficient staff support, and LA Unified School District leaders convinced that meeting the demands of teachers would result in financial insolvency could, in relatively short order, find places of agreement and compromise guided by their shared concern for the well-being of young Angelinos and despite some still unresolved concerns. So I hope you will forgive my gross oversimplification of the politics of both federal and local shutdowns when I suggest that this tale of these two cities, of DC and LA, provides a suitable backdrop for today's event. For in her writings and lectures, Dr. Rubio argues that the search for common ground can perhaps most successfully be pursued in the local sphere, which she identifies as the space between the personal, that is, the realm of individual belief and action, and the political, that is, the realm of government. As she argues in her book, Christians, and here I would dare to extend her claim to all persons of goodwill, need not avoid the world or foolishly hope to totally change it but they can find ways to powerfully work for a fuller vision of human flourishing at the level of culture rather than in the realm of politics. 
The work of Dr. Rubio and indeed our mission here at Loyola Marymount University could not be more relevant to the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. They urge us to look past the perils of ideological polemic and to find the courage to believe in the possibilities of dialogue, of progress, however incremental, of mutuality, and of hope. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Hanlon Rubio to speak to us today about finding common ground in a polarized world, possibilities, and perils. Thank you, John. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay, good. Um, it is wonderful to be back here at LMU. As John told you, I started my career teaching here when Tom Rausch was kind enough to, to give me my first job, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. I also have a connection to LMU. My father-in-law went here back in the 50s, Hector Rubio, and he was a football player and he studied, and he, um, he was here during a time when encountering the other um, happened in philosophy and theology class in a pretty combative key from the way he told it to me. They would study what other people thought and then learn how Aquinas would show them that the other people were wrong. <laughs> um, um, and, and that's, and he would, we would argue about the right way to teach theology today. And it was, it's really, my relationship with my father-in-law was really important to my growing work in Common Ground. When my husband and I met and married, we belonged to different political parties. And even though we were both Catholic, we came from different parts of the church and really different cultures. And somehow we found each other. We like to say that we found, we're kind of like a Venn diagram. We had this little part in the middle that was, where that was the overlap. Um, but Hector and I didn't have much overlap, uh, but we had lots of conversations over the years, and without those conversations, I wouldn't have had contact with a politics and a Catholicism that was very foreign to me. And although today he's, he's 88 and he is struggling with dementia, uh, he does remember my name. He doesn't want to argue theology anymore, but I think those conversations were important, and I'm grateful for them. Today I'm honored to be here for Mission Day and excited that you've chosen this topic, that you want to deal with it in its complexity. The title I was given it suggests that. And so I'm going to talk about some of the possibilities for common ground that I see, lay out some of the steps, but also talk about some of the perils. A recent review of my book actually made me laugh out loud, uh, this one particular line. It was a generous and favorable review, but the, at one point the reviewer said, Rubio, um, in her desire to see a thousand flowers bloom, <laughs> sometimes overlooks persistent tensions. And I loved it. <laughs> and, and I posted on Facebook um, with, a, <laughs> with a hashtag flower child. And, and also, um, ironically, but, but more seriously, persistent hope. And I hope that we can talk about the potential to see a thousand flowers bloom or to see some common ground and progress without forgetting those persistent tensions, but also with a sense of persistent hope. And further, a sense of what LMU as a Catholic university might have to contribute to this work at this moment. So first, polarization. It's here where I don't think I have to spend so much time. John has already helped me out by laying out some of the tensions. I don't think I have too much of an argument to make, except that it's important to note that we live in this divisive time and that Catholics, as, as other Christians, aren't helping, right? Still, yeah, is this better? Yes, okay, good, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Catholics are just as divided as everyone else. That was true with the presidential vote, although there's still some controversy about whether Catholics broke for Trump or for Clinton. Uh, and that kind of division among Catholics has been a persistent uh, feature of um, the last 50 years or so. So it's typical that Catholics are divided. In the election, as people argued, so did Catholics. There were lots of arguments about, could you vote for Trump uh, or could you vote for Clinton? Would that be a sin? Would that be cooperation with evil, right? Was that a moral choice that a person could make? It was a fraught conversation. 
The party breakdown among Catholics mirrors that of the nation, it, um, and, and Catholic approval, disapproval rates of Trump also mirror those of the nation. So we are very much the mirror here. Even today, I, I saw um, on Twitter, 81% of Catholic Republicans support Trump's wall. 91% of Catholic Democrats oppose it. So the Republican-Democrat split on this issue, the same for Catholics. Maybe too much to hope that the Catholic tradition has something to offer to the development of Cope for Common Ground. But it's, this, is, this division that we have among us is deeper than this presidency. It is, I think, st still, still not able to. Let's try the lower it down here. Yeah? OK, let's try that. OK. All right. In the back, yes? All right, good. James Davidson Hunter, sociologist of religion at University of Virginia, was the one who coined the phrase culture wars to describe the divisions among us. And though that thesis has been criticized from various vantage points, I think that there is something to it. It's deeper than the divides on issues, hot button issues like abortion, immigration, et cetera, are the, is a divide that he characterizes as one between orthodox folks and progressive people. So he doesn't use liberal conservative, but orthodox progressive. And he says that these divisions hold for Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and also secular thinkers. So for the orthodox, briefly, uh, people, there is a source of transcendent truth that is relatively unchanging, whether it's linked to sacred text, authorities, reason, or science. For progressive people, truth is something that is progressively unfolding. We get some of it, but then we have to go back and think again. It develops changes, and we expect that. Right. Broadly speaking, people fall into one of those camps, Hunter, or Hunter um, argued. This, these divisions, then, are also deepened by sorting. Right? cultural sorting, the isolation that we have by neighborhood, by news source, by social media, by friends, by even the ways we spend our time. A recent study showed that, that, that people in the U.S. are much more less likely than people in other countries to have friends from different political parties. My own sons, and they're all in their early 20s now, tell me that they really can't imagine having friends who would hold differing views from them on certain issues. And they're sort of incredulous that I maintain friendships uh, where that's true. That's true. This divide can seem unbridgeable at times. And in fact, studies are pretty clear that debates and fact checking and all these things that we use really don't help people move and bridge these divides. They're, they're painful divides because as much as we might want to say, oh, it's just politics. Right? It, it's not just politics, because our positions on these kinds of issues that divide us, they have deep roots. It's about what gets us angry, who we sympathize with, what, what evokes our passion, what gets us out of bed in the mornings, what gets us into the streets. And so that's why it makes sense in some way that friending virtually or in reality, the other seems nearly impossible. And yet, I would argue that pol polls and culture war theses can't quite capture everything. For instance, if you look at polls that, that reaffirm the, the per uh, persistence of the culture war, often they ask people questions like, in general, is government a good thing or not? Do we need more government or less government? Roe v. Wade, yes or no? The wall, yes or no? Right? When you're forced into these kinds of questions, we choose a side. Right? But if you give people a little bit more leeway, it ten we tend to have a bit more compl complex answers. For instance, in one study that asked people uh, if they were pro-choice, pro-life, or both, a pro-life, pro pro 
most people, um, chose both, right? Chose both, right? That's not something that we generally hear in our polls. It's also true that some sociological studies of Americans that went deeper than polls found that there's, they, they evoke kind of a lot of complexity in their views that doesn't quite fit in the orthodox progressive mold. For instance, most people have a combination of views. They think that there are enduring truths that aren't just what I believe, and yet they think that there has to be a way, a pragmatic way to adapt them to certain situations. Right? They are, um, the sociologist Alan Wolf argued, modern traditionalist or traditional modernist. They, they don't fit in one camp or the other. Moreover, he showed that, the, that the, the salience of culture war issues is actually fading for most Americans. Elites and political people and academics are still arguing about this and fit into the camps, but many Americans desire more moderation and balance. Now, there's a downside to that. They tend to be a little bit less engaged and apolitical. Um, maybe not as upset as they should be. But there's still something there that isn't captured in the culture war thesis. And yet, <laughs> we can all see the destructiveness of the enduring war. Sometimes, I think, we believe that tolerance can be a solution. I know my students at St. Louis University are quite, many were quite convinced that tolerance was the most a very important moral virtue. To not judge, right? to not call people out, this was very, very important. It made it very difficult to run an ethics class. Right? I had to really encourage and role play and everything else to get them to engage in debate. And there's something to tolerance and there's something to non-judging. Non I don't want to say that there's nothing about it. It enables us to make it through the wedding, the Thanksgiving dinner, the difficult conversation where we just don't have time to engage. And yet, it doesn't really get us anywhere. Even if we, say, try to understand why those people think that way, hillbilly elegy, perhaps, that doesn't really help us move, right? Because we can still remain quietly certain of our own rightness. If we don't put our view out there, then we avoid the potential challenge. I'm okay over here, you're over there and wrong, <laughs> right? And neither of us have to move. So we need something else, something beyond tolerance, as your mission statement rightly affirms. So what are the possibilities for developing common ground? In, in my book, I talk about a couple things we have to get out of the way, and then a couple things that we can do. So some things I think we need to get out of the way. One difficulty with current conversations is that it seems that some people are that there are sinners and non-sinners, whether we're religious or not. And what I think is really great about the Catholic tradition, and I can say this as somebody who grew up in the, in the, the 70s where sin was not a big thing that I was taught to, taught to think about. <laughs> we are much more flowers and sunsets and God loves you. So I really like the part of the Catholic tradition that talks about sin. Right? And I realize that has something to do with my social location. But so when we walk into church, those of us who, who do, the, one of the first things we do is say that we've sinned, right? I have an older Catholic friend who says, I hate that. And I say, I love that, right? It's a great place to start. <laughs> right? it's, not the, it's not the only thing we need to know. We need to know God loves you some flower and sunsets and all that too. But we need to know that. And beyond personal sin, the Catholic tradition provides this great language of cooperation with evil, sometimes rendered today complicity, that helps us understand that all of us, all of us are complicit in sin that we're not intending, right? So, right, so it's not just what I've done intentionally, but it's all the, thing, all the ways in which I 
make, move evil forward, even though I'm not intending it, and some of those ways benefit me. Right? I think people on both the right and the left believe this, just they see it in different realms. So we might see it with what we buy, or cities we visit, or candidates we support, or votes that we make, where we put our money or our time. Without intending it, right, we cooperate with evil. We're complicit. I think of myself um, as a university professor. I don't intend the evil um, of what my, everything that my university does. I would put in that realm right now um, some of the way that we treat our non-tenure track faculty. And I benefit from that as a full professor with a big salary and the luxury to research and travel. Right? It's not my intention. I don't want it that way. And yet, there it is. Right? And in my silence, the Catholic tradition suggests I am complicit. If we can start from there, I think that's helpful. Right? Then, rethinking what we can expect from politics. Right? If we all concentrate up here, where the, the hot-button political issues are and about laws and policies, and maybe you can think here at LMU, if you think about your highest level of policies, if, you, if you're only talking there, then it may be difficult to make progress. And it may be too much to expect that politics is ever going to be all that we want. And this part of my argument, I, I, I point back to the Jesuit John Courtney Murray. And he wrote in the mid 20th century a book called We Hold These Truths. And he said, well, what he, was he was trying to really make a place for Catholics in American politics. And he said, what we need to realize is we hold certain truths in common. But that, what that allows us to do is argue. If we can't argue if we don't hold anything in common. If that's what we think of as, he called it, civility or politics, then we're in a pretty good place. We think that we can make a little bit of progress, get a little bit more justice, but not have a perfect society. Okay. If we don't think that we're building the kingdom of God completely, in our political system, we might be in a better position to make progress. So if, let's say we get that out of the way. Then what can we do? I know you've been talking a lot here at LMU about discourse, about inclusive discourse. I have put on uh, your handout some, some of the rules for engaging in conversation. Um, they come from a friend of mine, uh, theologian, Fordham theologian, Charlie Camosi. I don't think there's anything completely original about these rules, although it's still really hard to follow them. I'll just say here that if, um, if you can do this, things can happen. And I say that speaking from experience. In my own field of moral theology, one might think theologians get along really well, but not so much. And particularly in the, in the generation preceding mine, uh, moral theologians on different sides certainly didn't sit down and have dinner together. There were deep disagreements, um, especially after the Second Vatican Council around Humanae Vitae, and, uh, especially, and a host of other issues. The next generation of theologians decided we didn't want that for us. And so despite those disagreements that were still there, um, many of us decided we were going to, um, to get together. Um, there was a gathering at Notre Dame called New Wine, New Wineskins, where early career theologians came together to eat, to pray, to talk. I have some association with that group and friendships with many of the people who were, who were important to it. And what we did was keep talking. <laughs> And we became friends over time in ways that I could not have imagined. And a lot of the time, that was with humility, curiosity. Why do you think that? What led you to that position? Can we both agree on this? Right? And sometimes it meant bracketing the controversial issues, and so we could work more over here. 
Now, you might think, well, aren't you just sort of kicking the ball down the road? <laughs> Eventually, you have to get to those issues, and that's possible. But we've been able to do, I think, an awful lot of good theology by working in another, by bracketing some of the difficult issues and talking about what we could. And more recently, we've been thinking about, okay, we've built all this up. Now we need to go back to some of those things we weren't talking about. <laughs> and now we need to see if we can make some progress then because of the trust that we've built up. So conversation that is real uh, is important. I also experienced that when I was a student at Harvard Divinity School, and I was asked to participate in some dialogues on the abortion issue. And people who had been active on the issue were invited into this space where it was kind of, kind of a famous experiment of, of folks who ran a center for counseling, and they wanted to use the skills they had learned in counseling to help people in political discussions. And so we were invited into the space, and nobody was identified um, on either side. But, but we sat down and had dinner together without knowing and, try, and trying to guess right, which side was so-and-so on. And then we told stories of how we came to our positions. And then we were invited to say, what bothers us about our side? And we are invited to ask an honest question not a, isn't it true that kind of question, but an honest question, I've never understood this, can you help me, right, of those on the other side. And even though it was just a three-hour time frame, uh, there was something that happened in that conversation that was enormously helpful, right? So building up the skills in that kind of conversation the kind of conversation we don't see in social media or at family dinners, for that matter, is helpful. What else might we do? I, I talk in the book, as John suggested, about this the space between. I, and, and this is something I've tried to do in my own work, is move the conversation over. So for instance, on the contested issue of contraception in the Catholic tradition, I wrote an article um, called Beyond the Liberal Conservative Divide, in which I looked at the arguments that more liberal and conservative theologians were making, and I said, Look what they agree on. Right? And wouldn't it be interesting if they could talk from there? And first, it was really hard for me to get it published. Uh, people who came to the talk didn't like it. Uh, and, then, and then the editors kept asking me, well, what's your position? And I said, it's not my question. Right? My question wasn't that. My question was, what do we agree on? And could we move a conversation? And could we have a conversation that, could we bracket contraception and have a conversation about what sex is, what it means, what it could be. And it turns out we could have a lot of good conversations about those issues that we didn't think we might be able to have. So what is that space between? I think this is the space actually where most ordinary people live. That is, most of us aren't going to make our big mark in society with new legislation, with new policies. We're going to do what we do in our lives, in our neighborhoods, communities, schools, workplaces, in the local realm, right? This is a realm where we can be both faithful or faithful to our principles and potentially effective. Some worry that we can't be effective because the real problems are up here. I'm not so sure, not so sure. I think, for instance, of an organization that I worked with at St. Louis called Voices of Women. It started um, through Midtown Catholic Charities in the city of St. Louis. And it started really as a, a group of church ladies, right? <laughs> Getting together, doing activities. Um, but it moved beyond that when they started talking about what was going on in their neighborhood. And they started organizing. And they did things like trying to push back uh, to one of the big guns in town, Washington University, that was encroaching and gentrifying their neighborhood. Um, they successfully started a savings and loan for children and adults in their community. They successfully started a small uh, grocery store that had healthy food, brought healthy food to their community called City Greens. And they, um, they worked together, and, the, and when they started, and, and as they did this, they empowered each other, right? 
they realized that they were thinking less um, about what had brought them together originally and more about these bigger picture issues. Now, they didn't change everything in the city of St. Louis, and there are still an awful lot of problems, but I wouldn't call what they did insignificant. And I imagine that their children watching them are learning something. And I also imagine that the bishops that they got to speak to and some of the other politicians who listened to them are also learning something from the experience of these women who are gaining their voice. It's possible to be faithful and effective. It's also, I think, true that transformation can come about through shared work. So sometimes people say real transformation can only happen at this big structural level, right? The data on how people change their minds, though, says that people change their minds when they work alongside people of different people with different views on a common project. Right? That's where the real dialogue and movement happens. So if we can get together in this local space, that's where the long-term conversations can happen. It's also true that that's where some of the social transformation that we might seek has to happen. Right? I draw uh, on uh, the work of um, Brian Stevenson, so well known for his work in the legal realm and on race, and he talks about the importance of proximity. That is, we can do these far away things, these campaigns in Washington, but a lot of transformation happens when you are in close proximity with other people. He particularly is talking about being in close proximity with people who are hurting. But he also talks about what can happen in the local realm more generally. In a recent interview, he wrote, so the policy work is critically important, but it's not enough to pass the law. It's important to do the work. That work has to be married with the narrative work, the work on hearts and minds. Right. And I think there he's telling us that, of course, he's trying to get laws changed. He's trying to change the criminal justice system. But he also knows that some of the work there is going to happen on the ground, in conversation, in shared action, especially, hopefully, with people who are, disagree with each other. The possibilities for this kind of change, I think, are untapped. <laughs> for the church, when I think about the, the church, I think, what, is, what if we stopped worrying so much about what happens in Washington and started doing things on the ground? Not just the clothing drives and the food drives and things like that, but pulling on all the resources of all the people in the pews. <laughs> and figuring out how to problem solve from the ground up. The theologian Bill Kavanaugh says that the, that the Catholic Church, among others, remains in captivity to the nation state. We can't think outside that realm. Sometimes in ethics, I feel that we have that same problem. We can't think of solutions that don't involve policy change. Perhaps at the university level, too, we can think there are certain policies <laughs> that we really would like to change, but maybe we can't change them right away. But what could we do? What kind of community local transformation right, might we able to affect by working in the space between? I know that this is, um, in some ways, unsatisfying to people. Um, let me give an example um, that I'm borrowing from, a, uh, from theologian Kathy Caveney, who works at Boston College. Caveney suggests that even if we want this total transformation and it feels like giving up if we, if we don't go for it, sometimes just standing, waving our flag, saying this is really the problem, this is really what we want, actually gets in the way. And she gives this hypothetical example of dueling. And she says, imagine that you're going into a town in the old Wild West where people were, are dueling all the time to solve their problems, as was the case. If you, just started to, if you just started a campaign to do away with dueling, you wouldn't get very far. Even though, this important point, even though people are dying, it may not be 
the right thing to do, to only work for the law that overturns dueling. But she suggests that you might get farther if you first brought together citizens who were committed to this and talked about maybe some rules for dueling, if you built up some ethics of dueling, right? if you worked from the ground up, then later you might be able to change the law because you had built up the virtue from the ground. Suggests that we might be in that position on other kinds of issues as well. When I go back to those stats that I started with on immigration, um, it doesn't seem like there's been much progress on that issue. So we could, we could hold to our commitments, <laughs> or, we, or we could um, try to imagine what getting to progress might take on the ground. Okay. Now, I have promised to talk about the perils of this kind of work, and I will. Recently, an author that I really love, Tiari Jones, author of American Marriage, which if you haven't read, I recommend, had an article in Time that went pretty viral uh, with a title that breaks my heart, right? Um, there is no virtue in seeking common ground. So I saw the title, I knew I had to read it. And, and she, it makes a very compelling case and I think articulates a lot of the frustration that people have with common ground talk. And she says, you know, uh, controversy is not inherently problematic. It is not necessarily virtue, virtuous to seek compromise. There is no middle ground on slavery or the Japanese internment. It doesn't really help us to certainly, it's not true to always, to say there are good people on both sides. She asked the question, is it more meaningful that we understand why some of us support the separation of children from their parents, or is it more crucial that we support the reunification of those families? She suggests that framing the problem as division really is dishonest, right? And maybe it shows a lack of heart, right? We're really sad that people are fighting instead of we're really sad that people are suffering. And this article um, was widely shared, and I think it gets to something really, really important. Common ground doesn't always mean compromise. It doesn't always mean the middle. And if that's what we think, yeah, I want to say, I'm not for that. <laughs> right? It's also true that sometimes this spiel that I'm giving right now is not the right thing to say. Sometimes what we need is some kind of prophetic resistance or interruption. So for those of you who are Flannery Connor fans and saw this line on my text, um, you've been waiting for this moment. Others of you are like that are thinking, what is, what is that line about the warthog? Um, but this comes from a famous story of Flannery O'Connor, uh, the 20th century Catholic short story writer and novelist. Called, the story's called Revelation. And in that story, there's a nice white woman named Mrs. Turpin who's sitting at the doctor's office thinking how lucky she is to be her, good and white and Christian. And she's also going through in her head all the other classes of people who are not good and white and Christian and property owning. And she's saying some pretty nasty things. And there's another character in the story, Mary Grace, who's not awesome herself. She's kind of a snotty white college girl coming home and seeing how backward her people are. Um, but, but Mary Grace, nonetheless, aptly named, uh, here's what Mrs. Turpin is saying. Maybe here's what she's saying in her head. And she throws a book at her. And she says, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Right? And Mrs. Turpin's like, whoa, me? I'm such a nice, respectable person. But this is an important moment of prophecy. And I think Flannery O'Connor would say of grace. So grace isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling of everything's OK. But grace sometimes comes by interruption. 
And that interruption allows Mrs. Turpin to have a revelation later in the story where she's looking at the pigs on her farm and suddenly she sees herself <laughs> as a pig. And then she has a vision of the last judgment of everybody walking into heaven. And instead of her and her husband at the front of the line, she sees her in the back and all the people who she thought would be at the back are leading the way. Now She doesn't change overnight. Uh, Connor was no, no big optimist. <laughs> um, but there was an opening, right, a moment of grace. And that came about through some interruption, right, some prophetic denunciation. We need that. There are moments for that. And yet, I would I'd say that from a Christian perspective, there is something fundamentally problematic about division. The brokenness is not just sad because it's not civil. The brokenness is sad because, from a Christian perspective, human beings are unified, and our destiny is to be unified with God and each other in the world to come. Sin can be understood as a kind of brokenness, original sin as original brokenness, among people, if you read the books, opening books of Genesis, maybe that's what's being described. In that sense, God's work of salvation can be seen as a healing of the brokenness, a healing of the world. And it might be then part of a Christian responsibility to participate in that healing of the world. Thomas Merton famously said that the suffering and violence in the world it's like the, a breaking of the body of Christ, the body of broken bones, he said. And the work of healing, the work of building what is in common among us can be seen um, as then particularly important work. I don't think you have to be Christian to think that that work of healing the body of broken bones is important, but I would say there's a special warrant for Christians to be a part of that work. So sometimes in order to get to the solidarity that is what we want, we have to be vulnerable to interruption, to having somebody throw the book at us, or willing to be the interrupters, willing to stand up. As, for instance, the, uh, the man did, right, who stood up in the church, right, and talk to his priest about the problems of the sexual abuse crisis. We have to be the, the prophetic denouncers, denouncers, as well as the graceful healers. But I would still contend that there is an awful lot that we can do in the realm of conversation and local action and building solutions. It's not completely satisfying. <laughs> Right? We want to be able to change the world, build the kingdom. Um, and yet, I think it is faithful to what Christians believe about the world, right? which is that there is a kingdom that's begun. It's beginning, but we're not going to see it right, this side of eternity. So we live in the tension of the already and the not yet, never letting go <laughs> of that vision that we're working for, but also realizing that it's never going to be all that we want. There's a kind of realism that Reinhold Niebuhr talked about, that John Courtney Murray talked about, that is rooted in a fundamental Christian understanding of sin and also of love. Right? In the context of LMU's mission, I think that contributing to the work of common ground is of fundamental importance, and you have a, potentially a special role to play, as do, I would say, all Catholic universities. You have the privilege of forming students, you say, for lives of meaning and purpose, right? So not just giving them information, but forming them, right? If they can be formed as responsible citizens who have skills, but more importantly, a heart for common ground, 
that could be transformative. If, if, they, if you can help them, and maybe they can help you, right? move beyond tolerance to mutual respect and understanding, not by avoiding conflict, but by moving through it, right? then you'll, you'll have given them something pretty amazing and pretty atypical. You want them to go and be men and women for others to struggle for justice in the world, but we also know <laughs> that that world has people of all kinds of different views just like we do here at LMU. And therefore, giving them the skills they need is more than giving them inspiring models who work for justice. We need to tell them the stories of the Oscar Romero's and the Dorothy Day's, the Martin Luther King's, the Malcolm X, the people who stood up <laughs> Right? who refused the call of moderation. We need to tell them those stories and inspire them in those ways. And yet we also, I hope, need to give them the skills for doing all the messy work of building up the common ground that can get us right, to where we want to be. I would argue that we want to help them persist in the struggle for justice, but also persist in the hope for common ground. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, Julie. Um, since this space is not particularly conducive to it, and since it would seem to fly in the face of the conversation we've just had to start shouting questions across a room to one another, uh, I'm going to propose that we adjourn to lunch um, in the Sculpture Garden. And those of you, and I'm sure there are many of you, uh, who wish to engage uh, with our guest further in conversation about this work toward common ground, um, I'm sure she'd be delighted to uh, continue the conversation. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I appreciate your time. Um, uh, please enjoy the rest of this beautiful day and join us for lunch in the Sculpture Garden. <laughs>